I'm glad you're here because it is a it is a particular topic of interest for me in that I'm I'm one of all boys. I went to an all boys school. I am, you know, I am of the cohort of people that get talked about when problems with masculinity and the views of women in our community are brought up. And, you know, when I see recently in Sydney there were blokes protesting outside a oh, single man. sex school, like how dare they go co ed. Yeah. <laughs> um you know, I absolutely know all of that world mm. and I understand how but I understand also as well what it was like for me to go out into the world yeah. and then suddenly go, oh, hang on, it's not what I got told it was. Mm. And why is everyone mad at me when I'm speaking to them in the way that I've been speaking about yeah. women and to women for yeah. the last however many years? It took a lot of unlearning. And when I look at university entrances of boys to girls and I look at you know what high school results are of boys to girls and then all the communication about you know teenage boys bad – Everything you do or say is, you know, wrong. Work. And you're raising a son. And I'm raising a son. Who's got to go out into yeah. that world. Nobody wants, and it's, it's hard to talk about. Mm. I was chatting, uh, I've dropped a lot of names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I was chatting to Maggie Dent yep. the other day. Um, because I th- it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was at the big park down the road, right? The really big one. And... It was packed. It was on a Saturday. It was maybe 150 kids there. Say there was half of them boys, so maybe 80 boys. They're all between the ages of two and five, yep. all right, because they're yet to be able to ride bikes where it's like, see as, ya. As parks are filled. And with. I look at these 80 young boys and I think, looking at the statistics, in 20 years from now, what does that say about how many of these little boys are going to punch their boyfriend or girlfriend in the head? Yep as the best opportunity, best thing they can do to get out of a situation they don't know how to handle. Like they'll literally punch someone in the face because they don't know what else to do. Yeah. And or, how many parents sit around going, can't wait for my boy to grow up to do that? Nobody. Nobody, Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. No parent on earth wants that. And it's such a complicated issue. And I deeply feel it as the mum of four boys as well. And I so want to raise boys that can navigate this world. My biggest thing, if I can tell you how I got into it. Yeah. So um, I am, I'm a social worker. I'm the daughter of a family therapist, narrative therapist. Um, my mum worked in mental health for years. So I grew up with, um, I'd go to the, the Chatswood Community Centre and I'd hang out with all the old guys with schizophrenia. I'd listen to marriage counselling happening in my home. My mum went from home. So I'm immersed in this world that I'm still in, right? And then I got pregnant with my first baby and I was really well read, really, like I went in going, I am going to be an amazing mum. Like watch me win the Olympics for mumming, right? (laughs) And it all went really well until around the time I had a second baby who had reflux, my older child turned two, he started hitting biting, he bit bit my friend on the stomach once, uh, pushing, uh, melting down. And I suddenly went, holy shit, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And it, and then I sort of reflected and thought, well, if I'm kind of as as you could possibly be for this yeah. and I find myself knowing the parent I want to be in the moment and not being able to find that, like reverting to exactly how yeah. I was raised or really just being less emotionally resilient than my two-year-old, then nobody gets off this for free. And so I kind of embarked on a mission to kind of grow myself up, develop myself. I did circle of security parenting. I did tuning into kids. I kept learning really for myself. And it's kind of now turned into so much more um, for others. But I have such compassion for the modern parent who is, you know, I think it's way harder to be a parent now than it's ever been because we know more. The information overload is huge. So we know, Mm. you know, you shouldn't be smacking your kid and you shouldn't be sending them to their room and you should be welcoming their feelings. We know all that. We don't need to know more. And yet we're trying to do it differently to the way we were raised. I'm I'm from a loving household, but if I did the wrong thing as a kid, I got smacked and I got sent to my room. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so then I have my two-year-old and he's doing the wrong thing. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to smack, but I don't know what to do because Mm. it was not modeled for me. Yeah. And then what we don't realize is that in the moment we see our child with our mind, not our eyes. So we're not seeing the child in front of us and what they need from us in the moment. We are reverted back to, you know, all kinds of shit. And essentially how our parents felt about feelings 
is one of the biggest things that's impacting how we go with feelings, not yeah. just in how we parent, but how we live, love, work and grieve. And 90% of how you feel about feelings gets set up in the first 11 months of your life. Right. Right? So by 11 months, you've learned to read which emotions you show as a baby make your parents feel more happy, more engaged with you, yeah. more frightened, more scared, more dismissive. You've learned we do this, we don't do that. Wow. And then imagine if you're a male baby and boy, little boys should be tough and they shouldn't cry. And yeah. So if we can do a little bit better every generation than the one before, yeah. I think that's a really good thing. It's, it's hard to talk about. I remember having conversations with my, with an ex about how I got whacked as a kid and look at the time. I don't like to say it, but that was a message that got through. Like it's a message that did get through. It really helped me go, oh, hang on. I really can't keep capping on like this. Yeah. I've got to pull my shit together. Yeah. There may have been another effective way to get that message through. It may have taken more time <laughs> than the less than 10 <laughs> seconds it took for the four master to hit me with the big thing. Yep. But I figured it out pretty quick. <laughs> you did. Can I actually, can I tell you a story? Yeah, please. Um, so I, I worked with a dad once and um, something he said just has really, I think it nails this. This was a dad where um, that he'd been pushed reluctantly into a parenting course with me by yeah, his yeah. partner. And he was from a family of origin where um, culturally he wasn't allowed to show emotion. And not only just boys don't cry, but even if he got a bit too joyful or exuberant, he was told to settle down, mm. right? Which is really common for yeah, men. And yeah. here's this dad raising three girls, doing an incredible job. And he one day we sort of wound up catching up and he said, Jen, you know what? I want to ask you a question. And he said, because I get it. I'm doing the stuff. I'm sitting there and I'm saying, oh, you know, I can see you're having some big feelings and I'm parenting in this way. And he goes, it works. Like I, aside from any evidence you've told me about why it's important, I can see it works. I'm doing it and it works. But I have this one lingering question. When I was a kid, if I did the wrong thing, my dad would have hit first, asked questions second, and I respected him. I knew, like, don't do that again. And he goes, my kids tell me I'm the worst dad ever and they kick me in the shins. So do my kids respect me? was his question. I just love this question because I think many, many modern parents would be thinking this. And I said to him, look, the evidence is really clear that what kids need from us, particularly in the first five years of life, is just to know that one primary caregiver can meet their needs, not all the time, 30% of the time is what we're shooting for. So if we've got one safe person that can do that for every child, that that's the single biggest indicator that turns out someone that can um, reach their academic potential, their social potential, has lower incidence of mental health. Like it's a really good thing. So that says that, but I said, that's not what gets me out of bed. What gets me out of bed is if we do it in the way your dad did it or in that way, when kids are sick, they're going to think, I don't want my parents to know. And my goal for my four boys, when they muck up and they will, is that they will think I know who to call. Yeah. Right. So that's my goal. And this dad said this, he goes, he was silent. I thought, I don't know whether that landed. I don't know whether I got through to him. And then he said, Thinking about it, uh, I mucked up a lot when I was 16 and I never would have. I was like, I can't let my dad know. And then he paused and he goes, and you know what? I'm really good mates with my dad. I consider us to have a really good relationship. But if I had an emotional problem now, he yeah. would literally be the last person on the planet that I would go to. Oh, man. And I went, that's what gets me out of bed. Right. Like that's, that's what motivates me. When I doubt it, when I worry that maybe these kids are out of control, I think – the relationship above all else. This may be the first time someone has heard, what do you mean? You don't whack them. Because <laughs> no, as don't. terrible as the consequences are, it's very time efficient. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and Whatever's going on stops <laughs> and something else begins. Whatever that is, it could yep. be chaos. Yeah. Like what is the fastest way that you could deal with something like that? It's such a good question. And Truth be told, so uh, can I do an example? So just say one of my kids hits the other one, okay? Super triggering as a parent. One of your children hits and hurts the other one, they're crying, and as a parent, it's a horrible feeling. You think, oh, my gosh, you're headed for prison and, you know, this is I'm stuffing it all up. So just say I do what we all want to do, which is fly across the room and say something like, we do not hit in this family, go to your room. Like right. I can't even look at you. Go to your room. Yeah, right. Now, first of all, I've done that. Okay. Yeah. Second of all, we all do that. Anyone that says that doesn't is lying. 
But what we know from the evidence is my child may go to their room. They may even come back out 20 minutes later and say they're sorry. But what we know is that what we, what I haven't done, I haven't ta- taught them in that moment how to identify the emotion that led to the hit. No child chooses to hit. No child chooses to be a bad kid. They're hitting because their emotions got the better of them and they weren't able to regulate through that moment because of the nature of development. And what I haven't done because they're now in fight or flight is have an opportunity to coach them to do it differently next time. So I can get a quicker result for sure by sending them to their room or the old school method of smacking, which I don't advocate because, you know, (laughs) you shouldn't hit kids. Because there's evidence. You, know, you shouldn't hit kids. You shouldn't do it. Just, like, don't hit your kids. I know it feels like the thing you want to do, <laughs> but here are all these scientific research results that show it's clear. not a great idea. Not a great idea. Not a great idea. But, you know, you're not wrong if you feel that urge to, and, you know, we've all been there. But, you know, a lot of parents would still be using methods like, if you don't stop that, I'm going to throw your favorite toy in the bin. There's threats. a threat, yeah. So we've got threats. We've got go to your room. We've got I'm just ignoring that and hoping it goes away. This is the stick. So the mm. old-fashioned stick, we sort of know it doesn't work. As in it, carrot and stick. The carrot and stick. Yeah, yeah. Yes, correct. Thank you. So the carrot is begging, begging, bribing, reward charts. We're doing a lot of that as modern parents too. And then we've got the stick, which we sort of know we shouldn't do. I want to sort of clarify, you can still use these things in your parenting. So I would at least once a week say to my kids, clean up your room or there's no Nintendo. That won't teach them long-term to be cooperative, great Mm -hmm. kids that intuitively spot a need and and participate in the team. It will get the room cleaned. So in answer to that question, what's the quickest way to get Mm. the result? It's probably the stick. Yeah. But- I want long-term results. I want a relationship long-term. I want the kid that stops hitting their sibling. I don't want to have to send them to their room every 20 minutes. So if if it's persistent, if it's problematic, if it's a value you want to work on, you're going to have to do it the hard way. And so what I would do in that same scenario where my child hits the other child, I fly across the room. I'm still setting a boundary. Like I'm a big fan of a big fat no. And I would say something like, can't let you hit. I will not let you hit and I will physically stop them, Mm. right? That's important because modern parents, they're trying not to smack, but then they don't realize that they actually do have a physical role in boundary setting where there's a safety risk. So they are physically going, I'm actually going to hold your arms if you can't stop because that's kind. My child doesn't want to be hitting or hurting or throwing. So I'm going to help them with that. I'm going to try and then remain as neutral as Switzerland and say, whoa, guys, it looks like something went on here. And if I can do that, what I'm doing is I'm allowing the space for like, you didn't hit for no reason. You're a good kid. And are you okay? And I wonder what led to the hit. And then I can find out more. And then I've got this in because I've showed both kids empathy. Yeah. And now instead of one child shutting down, going into fight or flight, I now have an opportunity to go, okay, So he sat on you or looked at you funny and then you knocked over his Lego tower and then you got in this big fight and then you hit. That didn't go so well. So what can we do different? And now we have an opportunity Mm. to learn. And it is the better way, the faster way to create that longer term change and even shorter term change within the home. But will it get you a result if you've got a podcast guest coming? No. You, you, the, the sometimes. Meeting, the the, the sometimes, guys delivering the thing. Sometimes you're going to have to grab your child and go. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, you've, you've got to meet your dad for something. You've got to go and like. Yeah. So it's complicated. Something's boiling on the stove. The bath's oh. going to run over. So what parents need to know is that we're shooting to do this 30% of the time. Wow. And when you muck it up and when you say go to your room because it's safe for your child to be in their room away from you, then with you at that moment, that we've got the opportunity to repair. I got more than, I got less than 50, but more than 30 and I still finished high school. So that's a lower <laughs> bar than I thought it had to be. So that's good. What about in that moment? Like when you... When your window of tolerance is is low, is yeah. tiny, is a gap this big, mm. you're already up against it. You've been getting kicked in the spleen by a three-year-old or might. <laughs> you know, yes. you, you're cranky at each You've other. You've woken behind the eight You know, ball. there's not enough work hours coming in. Your fucking mortgage is going yep. here. Your job's going there. You know, your triggers are as hairy as they're going to get. Mm. And then when one clocks the other, 
how do you regulate in those moments? Yeah. Like it's freaking hard, yeah. especially when you're literally spinning plates and juggling chainsaws. Yes. Yes. What do you do? So what I do is I learn to spot the feelings of dysregulation building in my body in the moment. Yeah. Now that is hard, but what you'll notice is that when your three-year-old throws that meltdown in the kitchen or your kids are being super noisy in the car, um, there are some warning signs that you're going into fight or flight. Because when we lose it, we've lost it, not because we're bad people. Yeah. We've lost it because our brain has gone into fight or flight because actually the reality is our child is often showing an emotional triggering a feeling in us that in our family of origin that wouldn't have been safe for us to do right. so if i got sent to my room for crying and my child is in front of me crying and i've tried to fix it or solve it and i've tried the kind of oh you're having a bad day and they're still not stopping bit by bit my heart rate's going to increase my um, breath is going to get shorter my shoulders are going to tense my body is preparing the way it would prepare for an actual jungle animal to enter my kitchen right. because that was scary for me as a child. Yeah. It it's it threatened my relationship with my primary caregiver. I've learned at a biological level, this isn't safe. Yeah. So I can know at a cognitive level, it's just a three-year-old having a meltdown. And so then you snap, you yell, you find yourself in that place of the beast from the depths of the swamp comes out and says, go to your room or whatever you say, which is probably what someone said to you at some point or maybe not. Um, for some parents, if they were raised in a way that felt unsafe for them or they were, you know, if they were hit as a kid, they're trying so hard to avoid that, that instead of screaming, yelling, all of that, they run. They go, okay, just have what you want. Mm. Now that's just as scary for a child, right? That's, yeah. Right? So and just, it's, it's actually quite dangerous. I mean, we, I went to uh, Paul Dillon, this extraordinary uh, drug and alcohol yes, educator. Love Paul Dillon. Amazing guy. Yeah. I went to a fantastic seminar with him. I had him on the show. Um, learning about permissive parenting. Yeah. Um, and it's rife because so parents are trying mind. to overcome that family of origin that a they, a, they know at a cognitive level, well, that didn't feel good. And it, it's, t it, you know, the evidence is clear. That's not so great. So then they think, well, I'm not allowed to say no. Cause it, it's not that parents don't know how to say no. They say no to the biscuit and then the child melts down so badly and it feels so terrible for us. We either have to scream and yell and lose it ourselves, or we have to say, okay, just find just one and <laughs> no more. <laughs> And that is really hard. So you asked, how do I do it? Well, first of all, I don't do it perfectly all the time. Okay. I snap like every parent. I act graceless and, you know, I'm really open about that. I think it's really important anyone doing this parent education stuff can admit that they're not perfect. Do your older ones give you shit and go, put this on your Instagram, mum. Yes. I'm filming you. Yes. I'm, fil I'm going to put this on your Instagram. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny. I joke my older one. I, cut, I sometimes call him my broken pancake. You know, the first pancake. That yeah. you... <laughs> oh, fucking hell. <laughs> That's a way to go. I'll explain why. So um, the other night, my youngest child who can get quite, you know, he's sent to earth to test everything I teach. Um, he threw a fork at my 14 year old at the table, right? Not a great behavior. Um, and I flew across the table. I grabbed my seven year old. I said, I'm not going to let you throw forks but I can see you're really mad right now. So I said, I've practiced what I preach. I'm mm. doing it, right? My 14-year-old said, are you joking? When I was a kid, you would have made me stand and think. And I went, yeah, and I, I wouldn't recommend parents do that now. I'm so sorry I was oh. learning because, you know, we learning as we yeah. go. And I, I didn't know it all at the start. We don't know it. We don't get born knowing it. Look, the shame that we might feel for when we make a mistake like that, mm. that what you felt in your body when your elders talked to you, like, yeah. Yeah, you were able to come up with a good line at the time, but deep inside, it's like, oh, fuck me. No, oh, fuck, I've blown that one. I'm going to be fine. You're going to go to a therapist when you're 20, aren't I? <laughs> so I've learned to get, I've learned to be much more kind to myself. I used to speak to myself as a young mum much more harshly. I'd sit on the couch every night and go, oh, I fucked that up. I yelled or I didn't get it right or I'm not giving enough to my baby or I'm not, you know, not nailing it for my toddler or whatever, right? I absolutely would berate myself. And then I've done my own work and my own journey around self-compassion and I love Brené Brown and I love Kristen Persneff. And what I came to realise, not only just from the evidence, I love evidence, but the evidence shows that the way we talk to ourselves is as threatening in terms of putting us into fight or flight 
as the way if if you walked into my living room and went, well, you're a shit parent, like you've mucked that up today, Jen, what a loser, you know, my heart rate would go up. And what yeah. happens is your body experiences that as a threat and then you are less likely to go better for your child the next day. That's what's crazy. So for your child, you're trying to show up and be more patient the next day. You berate yourself thinking that will make you a better parent and it doesn't. So with practice, I learned to be kinder and I would catch myself saying, oh, that was terrible. And I would go, you know what? I'm a really good mum. I try really hard and I'm doing the best that I can and I'm learning and I'm human and I'm modeling being human. And so I've actually just worked at that bit by bit. And that's what I teach parents now. It's kind of wild. No one has to know that I'm doing it, but you did that. I can see you're really trying to self-regulate there. <laughs> You've done a really good job of those first couple breaths. Yes. I reckon next time you do it, you might be able to get a few more. Yes. The se- but that's self-talk. <laughs> that, yes. But that's, I'm doing that. So I will, I will sometimes like I'm in the car and the volume of all the kids and I want to scream, shut up. And I will just take a deep breath and I'll go, this is really hard right now. A lot of people would feel overstimulated, you know, and then I say, guys, I'm going to need it down instead of responding in a way that maybe isn't kind um and not perfectly and I don't always nail it but what I'm trying to do is be nicer to myself and find the wins yeah and I know you think 30 percent sounds low it's actually a really good amount it's a big number actually when you think about how busy it is just to keep people alive and not stabbing themselves with various household objects that you can no longer you can't house once they start moving independently (laughs) you're like I could try to childproof everything, but then we couldn't live here. Yeah, like. exactly. And so anyone with a three-year-old knows they can have emotions from the minute those little feet hit the ground all the way through. And you can you can sit in about 30% of those before you start to really kind of lose it yourself. Yeah. So it's okay to sometimes go, yeah, I'm just... I'm not attending to every single feeling. And in fact, that's a really good thing for kids. Even for babies that might be feeling frustration, our instinct can be to step in and fix that, solve it, take that feeling away. It's uncomfortable that you're frustrated because you can't reach your toy. But if we move that toy to the baby without just allowing a little bit of frustration, we're stripping them of the achievement when they finally reach it. We're stripping them of practicing the feeling of frustration. We make a game out of it now with getting Wolf dressed in the morning. (laughs) Um, He calls it the Wolfie show um, where he picks out his clothes and then I commentate his, I have a particular set of skills and I like to use them. I love this. I commentate him getting dressed in the morning like I'm a race caller, like I'm the race caller at Albion Park in Brisbane. This is a tip I'm going to use with parents. This is so (laughs) good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wolfgang this morning. And he's off, he's got the pajamas down, he's pulling them over the left, over the right foot, left left legs out first. Here we go. And like, that's. Is he going to make it? it. He's like full action stations. And he's in front of the mirror. Is he clear? Is he clean? What do the judges say? Gives me two thumbs up and we're good. And then we'll oh go. My God, that is it's so super good. fun, but he gets it done. Yeah. But nobody wants a kid that can't dress themselves. No. And no one would dream of having a child that doesn't know how to dress themselves, how to figure out which part of which is the front of the undies, which is the back of the undies, which is the front of a t-shirt, which is the back of a t-shirt. So why do we see it so differently when it's like understanding that you dealing with frustration is a part of growing up and me being with you frustrated? is a part of that. I'm going to have to be with you being pissed off Mm. because you're going to need to learn how to get out of being pissed off or being frustrated or being angry or being sad. Without telling you don't do it or fixing it for you. What's the, what's the line there of, you know, when do you, as you mentioned, when do you move the toy? Because we want to have independent kids. Mm. When do you move the toy? You know, at what point is it 30%? Is that a magic number? Like at what point do you step in? One of the things we can learn to do is comment, and this is my biggest tip, is commentate out loud about what we see. And the French have a term, they call it the le pause, (laughs) which actually means to pause. And they apply it to their parenting in general. Mm -hmm. So from the minute that newborn cries, it's not that they don't attend to the baby. They attend to the baby, but they pause. Is that baby wanting just to be resettled or does it want to get picked up? And with our toddler reaching for the toy, if we can just pause and be mindful, what we're doing is acknowledging that those, our feelings about feelings, so meta feeling, how we feel about emotions, which was set in the first five years of life, are playing a role even in that moment. So our instinct to stop that uncomfortable emotion is playing a role in that benign seeming moment, right? So if we can just pause and go, 
oh, you're trying to reach the toy. And then we've got an opportunity to see if our child wants our help or not. Sometimes our child's not cueing us in. Mm. So they, they, our kids tell us what they need. So if we can look at the child, that baby is either going, help me, and they cry and they look at us and they communicate, or they're busy like reaching. And we can just sit there and be aware and go, mm. oh, it's tough. You've almost got it. Yeah. And then we're, if they do reach it, we're like, you did it. And we get to celebrate in that joy with them. Or they look at us for help and we go, you want my help? That's going to help with language and all kinds of things, but it actually makes them feel seen. Yeah. And I think we can be doing that. We can be talking out loud from birth. So we're changing a baby's nappy and they don't like it. Babies don't like their nappies being changed. I get it. Um, and we can be saying, you don't like this bit. Now that's going to calm our instinct mm -hmm. to kind of go, shh, 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 don't show it. But also I believe... 90% of communication is nonverbal. So our babies can take in that we're kind of getting comfortable with that from birth. And if we can just allow that a little bit better, we're communicating a message of like, I can have you come to me when you're happy mm. and when you're frustrated and when you're sad. Some of the time, I don't have to make space for that all of the time. I've got four kids and I'm human, but some of the time I'm just going to allow it. And talking out loud helps. You mentioned earlier when you were a young mum and you're sitting on the couch, nature's amazing. We get this really brilliant ticking clock going, hey, you missed a period. <laughs> Guess what's going to happen in about eight and a bit months from now. <laughs> oh, and so you have this wonderful kind of ramping up where there's like, I don't care how we feel about it. It's going to happen. Yeah. So we better get ready. Yeah. And then you have this learning curve where initially they're kind of, you know, squidgy and they, you know, you get the same two hours on repeat for about, three months, maybe yeah. eight weeks, 10 weeks, which is delightful. Yeah. And then you kind of go from there. And then there's what happened to me, which is I'm 41. No parenting experience with an 11 year old. Yeah. All right. Step parenting. Yeah. It's the parenting that no one ever talks about. Yes. It's the fatherhood that no one ever talks about. Yeah. And I kind of struggle with that because when I've met G, I was like, I need to get my shit together because yep. I can, I understand what, a you know close by kind of proximal male person in someone's life like everyone knows how badly it can go step mum yep. step dad doesn't matter mm -hmm. but a step parent can really mess things up and I did my best I made heaps of mistakes yeah probably more than I'd like to I don't think I got to 30 percent I wish I did uh but it's a very very difficult thing I would make you know I'd make the joke I've got you know an 11 year old kid with maybe about a month of parenting experience. I would have done it anything. I still like one day to the next. I was like, I'll do anything for you. Mm. Every dollar I earn is now to make your life be everything you want it to be. I'm, which is yeah. amazing for a selfish person yeah. like me, uh, you know, cause I, <laughs> you know, as you know, I've since found out as I've explained to me, cause I'd fallen in love with both of them. Mm. All right. It's a different, obviously very yeah. different thing, yes. but yes. the love that I had yeah. and the transformation that I'd seen in mates yeah. who had been loose, and then had a kid and it's it like, wow, how did you, you suddenly become a CEO of a company? You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Have you ever seen Looking for Alibrandi, the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's this scene where Anthony LaPaglia says to her towards the end, like, because he's a bit reluctant, he finds out he's a dad and he didn't know. So he didn't even know she existed yeah. until she was 17. And um, she's sort of, you know ripping into him and he says, give me a break. I feel like I've picked up a book and I'm halfway through it and I don't know what happened in the first chapters yeah. of you and I'm sort of trying to parent you and I'm like, you're going to have to be a bit gentle with me. Yeah, but yeah anyway, just remind me of that. It, it, was really, it was really hard because as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, like as the first couple of years, you're experimenting. Yeah. You know, you're – you're experimenting She's with also challenges. processing change and kids process yeah. any change. Like you coming into her mum's world is yeah. a massive change yeah. and kids process change. They actually kind of grieve the, it's, they can love you or love the new sibling or love the new school that, you know, any change and grieve the world they knew that was safe. Yeah. So they're processing that. And when kids are processing any change, they will test boundaries they will be more emotional and they will seek more connection from their primary caregivers. Yeah. So all of those things will ramp. Yeah. And so it's it's a bit of a perfect storm. It, it was very hard and I didn't have any of the things that we've just been talking about because, you know, this is a person practicing at, at being an adult yeah. by then, all right? So challenging me as an adult yeah. and I respond as an adult and then now I've got an 11-year-old girl crying. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because development is like, it's painstakingly slow. So do you know, I mean, I'm sure you know it, but to know that we sort of expect by three, by 11, by 15, these humans that can walk and talk and communicate and maybe negotiate their way out of a hostage situation, we think, well, they can emotionally regulate too. But their frontal lobe, that part of the brain that does all that is not fully formed till 25 to 27. Mm. So it's such a long way off. And we demand too much of kids emotionally and not enough of them physically is what I sort of find. Yeah. Yeah. We um, help seeking behaviors. Uh, you know, both of my parents were medical, they were doctors. Oh, right. So help seeking behavior was a part that was kind of instilled into us uh, as kids. And uh, actually, Audrey went and found this. Um, there's a, a children's hospital near here and they have a, a unit, a psychiatric, a psychology, psychological unit. Mm. And we went and sat down with a lovely psych, Debbie Amazing. was her name. And her job was to help parents negotiate the blending of families. How brilliant. And I, I love that I live in a country with a healthcare system that recognizes if we can intervene at this point, yeah. we're going to save everyone a lot of problems and we're probably going to get way better outcomes out of everyone involved here. Completely. And so while, you know, this is going to cost us however much money or dollars an hour for this particular healthcare professional to talk to these people, guess what? Guess how many, you know, tax dollars well, are going to come back in 10 years from now? Early intervention. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was really important. Like what, Audrey knew all this stuff, right? But I, I had no clue at all. And it was really, really powerful. And, you know, I, I, I can't undo uh, the mistakes that I made. I can only try my best to make good. You know what I mean? And it, it's, it's hard, you know. No parent can undo, like all parents make mistakes. Yeah. Um, you were making them with an 11-year-old. Most of us are doing it on a two or a three-year-old. But you, you can't undo that. The good news is, you know, that relationship, it's stronger than what you think. It's really got this incredible potential. Mm. Kids want to find the best in us. They actually want to love us. Yeah. And your role as that dad that came in at 11, like it's an incredible role. It's a special role. You know, we know that kids attach to one to two primary caregivers and that's generally their parents. So mostly step parents or other figures that wind up playing a really, like some people are single parents that raise a child with their mum or whoever, right? So we've all, there are so many ways to have a, a great family and you've got this incredible role to be this secondary attachment figure, right? And that's what most step parents are and uh, it's slightly different. And it's got incredible benefits to it as well. And the biggest thing I think that you should hold on to is that you did the work. Like you, all we can do yeah. is try to do better. All we can do. Is, and that's, yeah. that's it. And I just think there are so many people in eras gone by that didn't change at all ever. Like most parents I would work with would say that their own parents never, ever said sorry to them. Hmm. I don't know if your parents ever said sorry to you. I think I think mum and they? dad might have. Okay. They, they had access to medical journals. Okay, you okay, know, right. They, psychologists and psychiatrists okay. were a part of their like, oh. The majority of parents I work with would say, my parents never apologised. So saying sorry to their kids is hard. Yeah. It's actually a hard thing to do. And yet parents are sort of, they're doing that. They're saying, I'm sorry. I didn't, you know, I'm responsible for my feelings. That's not your fault. Yeah. And that's incredible. Like if we're doing that, that's amazing. It's, Yeah. It's uh, there's something in there, uh, Jan. I don't know if I'm gonna do something with it, but uh, it, like, cause there's a. I'm happy. I'm so happy that fatherhood and the visual uh, representation of fatherhood, at least off te- off television, is a very very positive one. Yeah. Dumb fat dad is still the guy in every commercial, yeah. and it really shits me. Same. It really really shits me that the only dad we it's see not the dads I'm meeting. No, the only dad we see. I forgot the fucking thing. <laughs> I eat terribly. I've got no chin. There's no jawline, and uh. and I look at it. I was like, there's no way that that hot, beautiful kind of milf would be married to him mm. if he's that looks like that and keeps fucking up like that. No, not gonna happen. That's a fairy story. I can tell you about the the dads I'm meeting. The the guys like you know I'm. I'm unfortunately not a millennial. Um, I like to consider that I'm I'm borderline, but I'm meeting millennial dads. Mm. They are hitting the ground, yeah. doing everything 
yeah. apart from physically breastfeeding. They are, yeah. you know, absolutely just attending to these babies in the most beautiful way from the absolute get-go. They're doing it differently. Yeah. And they're doing that. No one probably modeled that for them. They might have had dads that loved them, mm. but they dad would have been more of a breadwinner, not on the ground. And so parents are navigating this new modern village as a team. And I like I have a lot of hope for that. I think that's the way forward. Thankfully, we're all using the same reference point yep. of Bandit and Chili Healer. <laughs> yes. As possibly the greatest modeling of parenting that could exist. The the best. Yep. I agree. So there's possibly there's parents who are who are listening that might have might have grown kids. I mean, it might be the first time you know, all this blues happen after their kids have finished, have, have hit puberty. All right. They've, they've kind of missed this wave of this is a way. Do you feel that even though it's a, a you know, it's a book aimed at, and a concepts that are aimed at younger parents or parents of younger kids, do you feel that these concepts can work with, with older teenagers? I know they can, um, because I'm applying them daily with a 14 year old and because actually when we talk about attachment, we're talking about human needs. So these are needs. Uh, the reason I focus primarily on young children is that they're the ones expressing it the most. They're the parents that are seeking the help the most. And I really believe if we get in early, um, so I'm about early intervention. I believe if I can help you now with your three-year-old when your 15-year-old is doing what they do, you're going to be like, okay, this is hard, but we've practiced this. And so that's why I do right. what I do right now with this. But yes, to that parent that either has the 14 year old, it's not too late. And yes, there's something in it for you, but more to that parent, because sometimes we can hear these ideas and think, I fucked it all up. And I wish I knew this before. I wish I had read this book when I started or whatever. And I just want to say, you know, it's never too late. And the best way I can articulate that is for any of us, if we do carry things from our childhood where we wish we were heard more or we wish something was different, if you got a phone call from your parent, even today, and your parent said, hey, you know, I've been reflecting on this or that and I want you to know I sort of wish I'd done that differently or I'm sorry about that and I really love you and, you know, how would you feel? Like you would so want that right? I think we all want that as adults. So I, I think it is never too late ever to turn this stuff around or to start listening to say, hey, you know, I hear you. Um, I'm often working with parents and their parents. So they have their, their, a baby and then their parents are wondering how to turn up for them. And I say, support them, like mm. listen to them. So if they ring you and say, gosh, the baby won't sleep, instead of saying, well, you know what I did for you, just say that. Just rub that. some Bundaberg rum on our gums. That's what we did for you. <laughs> Put some honey That's literally in the... <laughs> what my mum did for me. Imagine if that parent said, oh, that sounds so tough. Can I bring you a coffee? And that's what we're doing for our three-year-old as well. Yeah, right. But that's all we want. And it's never too late to do that, even if you're 80 years old. Some kids, like there's a bell curve, right? And most of the time... Most of the kids. Are you going to say some most, kids are tougher? Yeah, most of the time, <laughs> most of the kids are mostly okay. All right? Yeah. And sometimes, like, brains are different, man. All yep. right? And yep. it's nobody's fault. People just come out. I know. How I, know. I, I live it firsthand. Yes. Yeah, so right. I know. I know. <laughs> so, look, when it comes to, like, particularly for this book, which is more aimed at younger children, but one of the questions I often get is, well, what about my child with autism or ADHD or significant behavior problems? Mm. And they say, does this apply? And I'll be like, well, first of all, if your child has additional needs in any way or there are struggles, I'm such a big fan of getting help. So mm. I'm always like, put your hand up and say, we're not okay. If anything ever in your home feels more than what feels normal or it's putting pressure on the other siblings or you or whatever, I'm like, go to a GP. Engage a psychologist, engage, I love OTs for kids. I think they do an occupational, inc therapist. occupational therapists, behavioral ones, help with social skills, with emotional regulation. You know, I, all of my kids have seen an OT because I want extra help. I want the help. So absolutely getting that extra help on board. You're going to need more strategies and you're going to need a team. So that's, first of all, I'm not saying we can just manage this on our own, nor should we, but the parent of the harder child, they need this more because they're struggling more than the kid with the, the parent with the easy child mm. to regulate their own emotions. So my book is about us, yeah. even though it says it's about little people with big feelings. It's about big people with big feelings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And actually it's about you having some stepping stones and knowing what to say if you didn't have a script for that growing up, but also giving you the tools in the front part of the book. It gives you the tools to look back at your family of origin and evaluate why you struggle, what to do different in the moment. Yeah. So that parent with that harder child and like my fourth child has been sent to earth to like, I've had to use everything I know and more to raise this child. Um, and so I get that feeling of, well, that doesn't work on my child. And then then I come back to this thing at the end of the day where I'm like, where do I start? What do I do about this? Because I'm always a new parent to the 14-year-old when the new stage hits. I'm always, we're always learning as parents. And then I think, what do I do? I need a parent educator. And I think, oh my God, I am one. What do I do? What do I do? And then I think, start with connection. Mm. They need connection. Like I believe it in my core. We're not getting anywhere with any other result. We've seen it in the justice system. We've seen it everywhere. If we go for, well, you're a bad kid and we're going to punish then that kid's got nothing to fight for. What does the connection look like in that situation? You're a good kid and we're absolutely going to set boundaries, but at your core we believe in you and we're going to have to find ways to get through and you're going to have to be creative and it's going to be about joining that child where they're at. What are they into? So if that kid is into video gaming, you might be playing some video games and getting into that, but you're going to have to join them somewhere in their world. You're going to have to hold those boundaries, but in a way that is, you know, firm, but kind. How can we have empathy for the fact that it sucks that I'm saying no to TikTok or whatever it is? And I would get it if you hated me. And that can be really hard to do. And especially if you're learning this for the first time, if that child didn't force you to push yourself as a young person, then you're doing it now at 12 or at 14. And that can be really hard for parents of adolescents. Um, but I really do believe, I do believe we have to start with that connection. You say connection one. All right. Yeah. So what is, what are like some other things that we just remember these thing in the moment when it's all flying everywhere and there's porridge flying across the room yep. or whatever, and the dog's doing this and the freaking's doing this, doing that and nothing's working in the moment. Like what's just like, two, five things, like the handful of things that you can just like so try I, to remember. I think kids come out of the womb almost asking you three core questions. Am I loved? And we answer that through the through connection and it's got to be more physical than you think because they can't process the meaning of the words I love you at five or three or at 15 because it's too abstract to, to adult, right? So we have to show them. And so it's a Maggie Dentism, but fist bumps, winks, your child walks through a door just delight because of who they are, not because they did the right thing or they put their shoes away. So that's one. Am I loved? We show it physically is the first thing and time, but it doesn't have to be a lot of time, but really those mini moments of connection is everything. The second question they come out of the womb, I believe asking is, am I safe? So initially we bundle them up and we hold them, but eventually it's boundaries that keep them safe. So it's saying, you know, I love you to the moon and back and I'm not going to put up with that. We've got to get confident with setting and holding those boundaries. But we've got to do that in a way that also makes space for how they feel about that. And that's what people didn't do so well in the past, right? And so that's also going, and the third thing they want to know is, am I seen and heard? And we answer that through welcoming those feelings, not all the time, but 30% of the time. And so that's when my child says, I hate spaghetti bolognese. And instead of me just saying, just have one bite and you can have dessert, or there are starving children in Africa, or just bloody eat it. <laughs> I say, ugh, you're not feeling it about dinner. That must be disappointing. I don't have to do, I, I can get them a new dinner. I cannot get them a new dinner. It doesn't matter. There's actually less pressure than what you think. Kids need less than what we think. If we could turn up and 30% of the time meet that need to know that they're loved, that they're safe and that they're seen and heard, we're nailing it. And actually the, all that other information about Montessori education and how we sleep them, how we feed them, how we show them experiences and teach them to be brave, it'll unfold. Our kids actually know what they're doing emotionally. It's kind of us just being able to show up in those three core ways. And I think it is as simple and as complicated as that. Are they loved? Are they safe? Are they seen and heard? Are they seen and heard? Uh, so there's the physical activity of like being there with them. Yep. Um, there's the, I guess, you know, the, the, are they safe? It's like kind of trying to make them sure that can look like boundaries. Yeah. Uh, and then seen and heard, you know, that's your singing narration if you need to. <laughs> I can see can you, you sing really it? Sing angry. It. <laughs> put it away, put it away. You're kicking me in the shins right now. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. It snaps them out of I it. sing a lot too. Do you it think snaps, that it snaps I used to sing the cleaning up song to get my kids to clean up. My kids tell me to stop singing though. Do you, does, does Wolf allow your singing? Uh, 
he's he's good with it. George is like, oh. yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, to throw another uh, another uh, uh, Bluey in there um, when he's being a proper pork chop, um, and he's like. It's just like whatever. I'm like picky yuppy. <laughs> I say it in Chili's voice, and he's like, oh, and he's into it. And away we're now we're picking everything up. And you're picking your battles there. You gotta do it. You gotta. You just gotta say, is this the hill I want to die on? Probably not. Ooh, I've got a lot of hills. <laughs> I'm holding. I'm holding a lot of hills. Like I'm like a platoon commander in a bad Vietnam movie. <laughs> hill 116. <laughs> Call in the airstrike. Uh. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here. And thank you for being okay with a chaotic morning that you well, somehow rolled into. I am a mum of four boys and a giant, enormous dog. So it just felt like home. <laughs> now, are you rolling the suburban side loader? Are you rowing the carnival? Or are you in like... The Not se- a carnival. I drive a, a VW multivan yes. with the electric doors. I love my car so much. I desperately want a two-tone one, like the really beachy, you know, like the, yeah. that's my goal. I'm putting that on my vision board. We you had put, the, you we put had Bluey the, on your we had the mis- <laughs> We had the Mitsubishi L300, which was the only uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight seater, eight seater yep. you could get at the time. Yeah. It was the only eight seater Did you feel market. cool in it or not cool? <sighs> I wasn't, I'm still not cool. See, I feel really cool. Like I roll up next to the bus driver at the lights and I'm like, hey dude, how's your crowd today? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like well, I feel cool. I feel cool the, up high. The, the V-dub, I'd not say that the Koreas don't make great products. They make <laughs> astounding products. I've driven a Kia Carnival. <laughs> They're fantastic. But the Germans? Yeah. It's just, it's a cool car. A I feel cool. Look, not everyone feels the same. People, other mums are like, oh, you poor thing in that big bus. But I, I love it. I'm Let happy. Let me tell you, there's a thing called the elk test. Oh, all yeah. Right? I, one of my brothers is in the automotive, automotive industry, and he told me all about the elk test. Um, the misconception, this is not what my brother said to me, but the misconception is like, oh, if I get an SUV, I'll be, I'll be safer. Yeah. All right. The elk test is banging a massive SUV down the road and an elk has just leapt out in front of you. Yep. And to what respond happens? to the rapid steering, because the center of gravity is so high, the rollover, mm. particularly once you start putting shit all over the roof, yeah. particularly if you jack up the suspension, yeah. your chances of rolling over high. versus a solid, low down, dirty van. Yeah. Mate. I'm driving a brick. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about the elk test, mate. Pass, help me also, pass I can test. pull up at the um, at the kiss and ride at the school and they can get in with their bags on and they can walk down the aisle, take a seat. I mean, it's a bus. You can get out gracefully as well. <laughs> yes. People always like, I'll get a stretch limo. Have you ever, you stretch limo is like crawling out of a pillow fort <laughs> in a ball gown. You don't want that. The proper role, like yeah. if you get the super black tint, now that's the tick. That's okay. the next one. You next get the... one. I want the two-tone cream and gold <laughs> with a tint. And you, uh, and I don't know what sports they're playing at the moment, but once you get the kind of awning so that I, I, I weep for you if they get into cricket. No, no cricket They're basketball, which is cool because they're in and out of there in two hours. Basketball but cricket, is one of my uh, close people, like, the kid's freaking amazing at cricket. Mm. They spend 10 hours it's in a, a long field game. on the other side of the country. Like I got out of bed at four. The first over was at seven. I've been here since 4 p.m. Yeah. I still haven't got 50 overs. Yeah. The only thing worse is probably rowing. That's a long way away. <laughs> Rowing's good though. I had a good time. Uh, thanks heaps for coming around. Thank you Real for having me. Really appreciate it.